let me um, start with a short introduction preview of what's happening at this third uh, session. According to our general plan, we, the first session was about democracies coming into being. The second session was about dilemmas and current problems of democracy, crisis. And the third is supposed to be on ways out, remedies, improvements, innovations. Let me uh, briefly uh, put some flesh on these very schematic uh, bones. States belonging to the regime type of liberal democracy, as it is in my reading defined by the four features of state capacity, rule of law, substantive contestation, and effective accountability. Such states show a great variety of institutional shapes and designs. Uh, the uh, designs are, and their differences are very well known. Uh, we have unitary versus federal democratic states, presidential versus parliamentary, unicameral versus bicameral, and so on. We have different electoral systems, different military uh, system, different uh, kinds of supreme or constitutional courts, and so on. Lo no liberal democracy is an institutional clone of any other of them. Yet one of the same liberal democracy as described by the institutional setup um, la laid down in its constitution and in formal procedural rules also changes over time. One of the characteristics of the regime form of liberal democracy is that it, its institutions are in constant flux, moved by constitutional policies and politics. The configuration of democratic institutions changes in the course of democratic politics. All democracies and their constitutions prescribe procedures by which all or at any rate most constitutional norms can be changed in case that change is deemed necessary and desirable. Usually super majorities are required in the interest of strengthening their legitimacy, efficiency and effectiveness. Democracies in contrast to traditionalist autocratic theocratic regime forms are constantly and reflectively self-monitoring systems, viewing themselves in the perspective of perfectibility. Democracies respond to changing conditions in their economic, military, technological and social alterations of their internal and external environments. Philippe has spoken about this. To avoid breaking, they provide for ample opportunity of bending. If they fail to respond by reflectively altering their institutional setup, they risk facing conflicts that they cannot absorb and channel. In democracies, there is a widely shared awareness that virtually no institutional arrangement is timelessly perfect and therefore self-perpetuating as if it were written in stone. Democratic self-monitoring and subsequent institutional learning can take place in two ways. These two ways I want to, to distinguish as sharply as I can. Uh, first, making sure that rules and constraints on the exercise of power are complied with. That is the liberal problem. Or making sure in addition, secondly, that a good policy and good policy outcomes are being generated, which I, for a shorthand, call the Republican problem, focused by the political left. They are, and the liberal, I'm, there's a vague right, left right uh, correspondence of these uh, uh, two uh, standards of goodness of policy. Both standards are premised on the insight that democratic institutions can turn out 
on both counts as fallible, as fragile, as precarious. Schematically speaking, actors of any kind can fail in two ways, two analogous ways, namely by doing the wrong thing and by failing to do the right thing. The, this distinction is significant in that doing the wrong thing, that is uh, for governments engaging in corrupt practices, interfering with people's liberties and so on, means to cross a sharp legal demarcation line, whereas failing to do the right thing, for instance, to boost employment, to promote educational <laughs> justice, depends on a politically contested standard that we apply to what the right thing is. Political rulers and political elites, as they perform their offices in the various branches of government, can do the wrong thing by violating basic rights of citizens, succumbing to the temptations of corruption and clientelism, discriminating against categories of citizens, and thus denying them equal rights and equal treatment, giving preference to their interests and passions while pretending to pursue it any notion of the public good, or violating their duties of office or mandate in other ways. Jon Elster has made the argument that not just supervisory and control mechanisms of various kinds, namely a properly equipped accounting office or uh, public support for investigative uh, journalism in the quality print media, that can serve as precautionary measures against the wrongdoing of democratic rulers and officials. In addition, the very built-in procedural rules themselves by which collective and collectively binding decisions are being made can help to prevent wrongdoing, bias, discrimination, corruption, and other kinds of what he uh, uses the term from Bentham, mischief. For instance, the rules by which candidates are selected and bargaining and deliberation takes place publicly or behind closed doors. While this task of preventing wrongdoing um, through ongoing democratic institutional innovations and the building of procedural firewalls is clearly a great challenge, the second task of preventing policymakers from failing to do the right thing is even far greater. For that, obviously, we would need to know what the right thing to do actually is in terms of policy outputs and outcomes that policymakers are to be prevented from missing. All we can say here is probably that policymakers fail to do the right thing if in future retrospect or in the eyes of a famous uh, impartial observer, they ought to regret one or all of three errors or policy inadequacies. Uh, inadequacies. What are these inadequacies? First, they have failed to be sufficiently far-sighted to make the policy in question viable and sustainable. They don't look into the future, they are myopic. Uh, or the future discounting. Second, they have failed to do the right thing in, if in future retrospect or in the eyes of an impartial observer. Uh, they have um, failed to design a policy in, ways that, in a way that is sufficiently encompassing in order for it to be socially inclusive. They are selective in the representation of the interests. And thirdly, they can fail to do the wrong thing if they do not take into account all pieces of knowledge that would have been available when a policy was launched. Um, such policies are often uh, tainted by avoidable, if not wishful, ignorance and other cognitive distortions so as to render it insufficiently Competent. So the three, the three uh, standards of a good policy are uh, farsightedness, sustainability, uh, inclusiveness, impartiality, and competent, cognitive competence. In other words, a good policy is one in which, which is adequately future-regarding, other-regarding, and fact-regarding. 
This is probably all we can say concerning the benchmark of a good policy. As beyond that, and democratically speaking, nobody can claim the authority to impose on the citizenry his or her insight about what the right thing to do actually is and consists in. The, the question translates into this one. What are the institutional conditions under which the people can at all find out what this thing is, namely the right thing to be done through democratic rule? <coughs> the popular failure to find out what the right thing is, Rousseau's problem, and to mandate representative ruling elites accordingly, thereby holding them democratically accountable for its implementation, has given rise in recent political uh, theorizing uh, to the debate between the proponents of uh, a better expression and aggregation of preferences versus the proponents of deliberative modes of forming preferences, expressing preferences versus forming uh, 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 preferences, um, as well as proposals for the institutional facilitation of the latter. Bob Goodin is going to present a novel institutional arrangement by which this issue of deliberation and how it is to be made consequential can be addressed. In order for political elites being able to do the right thing, an issue and related policy proposal must have, first of all, the chance to actually appear on the political agenda. In a time when non-political agents, such as rating agencies and other financial market actors, enjoy ample, if indirect, opportunities to shape the political agenda according to their priorities and, most importantly, can de facto determine through veto power and their capacity of non-decision making items that do not make it on the agenda, the popular will tends to get muted. Or more precisely, if the democratic state's capacity to act effic effectively on many issues uh, of urgent public interest is seen as having deteriorated under the impact of the financial market crisis, globalized competition, and aging populations, um, why should we, the democratic citizens, continue to pretend to believe that our preferences concerning the right thing can and will at all be taken into account by representative political elites whose space for action is much too narrow in order to represent a more encompassing uh, agenda? The evidently and highly constrained agenda and capacity uh, of uh, the fiscally starved democratic state, as well as its virtually permanent fiscal crisis, is discouraging growing parts of the citizenry of our post-democracy, as Colin Krauss has called it, or two-thirds uh, democracy, as Wolfgang Merkel uh, has called it, to consider the democratic voice as a meaningful political resource, the resources being devalued. What we see evolving, as said, is a widening gap, as I mentioned before, between populist politics, passionate po popular politics uh, without policy, and technocratic and intergovernmental policy making without politics, as the latter is being cut off from its sources of legitimation. Yet the encouragement for democratic will formation and the participation in it is not just a matter of my, the citizen's, perception of what the state is at all able to do. It is, at least to the same extent, contingent upon a conducive, communicative and associative framework in which it can take place. For I know only what my political will my preferences and my demands really are or should be when I know what those of others are with whom I then can envision to form an alliance or an understanding. If my will is only my will, 
without being shared by like-minded others, it does not possibly amount to an expression of voice. It remains noise that is likely to go unnoticed by elites. Lea Ippi, in her presentation she prepared for this panel, addresses exactly this question. Is there any better, um, anything better in terms of political world formation than the media infotainment with talk shows being delivered by elite speakers whom I have seen many times before in front of audiences consisting of non-elite people, none of whom I shall ever see again. She actually argues, as we will hear, that there is such a thing, a renewed form of hegemonic political party that would perform its classical function of both forming the will of citizens and transmitting it in effective ways to democratic rulers. So much for an introduction and a preview. Now the first speaker is John Elster.